very good evening to all of you. Mm, welcome all of you to Facebook Live Challenge of uh, the Task. This is a 34th webinar. And uh, today, uh, Dr. Tushar Dixit is going to speak on uh, the topic uh, safety in regional anesthesia, primum non nocet. That is, let's do not do any damage. So, Tushar uh, is a consultant anesthesiologist at uh, Liverpool. Uh, he has recorded this webinar because it is a uh, working hour for him right now because of. Uh, He's in uh, Liverpool. He has recorded, uh, sent the recorded version to me, and uh, I will make it live. Uh, after that, uh, if he is free, he will join the webinar and he will answer the questions. Uh, but it depends on his availability. Otherwise, he will answer the questions on uh, our Facebook groups. So you can ask your question. If possible, he will answer those questions. Otherwise, uh, uh, he will answer those questions on Facebook group. So I'm starting his presentation. Good evening, friends, and welcome to this Facebook Live session. My name is Dr. Tushar. I've been here before. Uh, uh, I hope you will enjoy today's session. The topic that I've chosen today is called safety in regional anesthesia. Primum non nocere. First, do no harm. I'm a consultant anesthetist for whom for those who are new to this session. I work in northwest of England in Liverpool. My special interest is in regional anesthesia, uh, onco anesthesia, and perioperative medicine. I also work for FRC exam preparation, and I'm the associate director of Mercy School of Anesthesia and a visiting lecturer to Manipal Academy of Higher Education, my alma mater, MC Mangro. I would like to start by giving a tribute to the pilots and the passengers of the Air India flight that crash landed in Kerala. And sadly, we lost pilots and some passengers. But this pilot also saved the life of many other passengers. And that's why I'd like to give a tribute to I found this uh, piece from an unknown author which says whenever we talk about a pilot who has been killed in a flying accident we should all keep one thing in mind he called upon the sum of all his knowledge and made a judgment he believed in it so strongly that he knowingly bet his life on it that his judgment was faulty is a tragedy, not stupidity. Every instructor, supervisor, and contemporary who ever spoke to him had an opportunity to influence his judgment. So, a little bit of all of those with every pilot we lose. And maybe this applies to some of our patients who have mishaps during surgery or anesthesia or in medicine in, in general. And that is why the question comes, who is responsible for safety? Well, safety is everybody's business. And sticking to the aviation theme, we are learning and we should learn more from the aviation industry of how to put processes in place make our practices as safe as possible. And that is why I've got a picture of the Swiss cheese model. That sometimes all the holes, or should I say loopholes, will be aligned together in one place. 
and something will get through and something will go wrong. But if you put more and more barriers, the chance of that happening will be lesser and lesser. And that is why Primum no no sere, first do no harm, I think it explains it all. So, safety in regional anesthesia starts before you get near to the needle and the syringe. You have to make sure you have the right patient who's having the right operation, who's received the right information and has the right education for the information you have provided. You have done the right preparation. You have the right personnel. You have done the appropriate checks and you have the right knowledge of the anatomy and the pharmacology. And then your success will be worth it and you will hit the bullseye. So pre-operative information. Everybody has their own way of providing pre-operative information. The purpose of pre-operative information is one education of the patient. You are educating them about why you are doing a certain procedure, what are the risks and benefits of it. But also, it's about protection. Protection of you and protection of your organization. This is the world of defense and medicine. And if you don't follow the right path, you will be liable in the court of law. In my institution, we use this information leaflet or information uh, form for regional anesthesia consent. We show it to the patient, give it to them to read, we answer all their queries, and we get them to sign it, and we countersign it. It talks about the general or generic complications of anesthesia, as well as some specific complications. Plus, you can add information to it. You don't have to have this piece. You can make your own, suitable to your organization. Before you do a block, also, the idea of a checklist, which is a memoir, it helps you, it makes you think of what you would have missed. Stop before you block. This is the Royal College and Regional Anesthesia Society initiative, where every time you're about to stick a needle in a patient, stop and think out loud. Is this the right patient? Am I doing the right block? Am I doing it on the correct side of the body? Make sure you take that moment, you halt moment, and think that you're the right all takes less than five seconds to do. Now this is going to be the big part of our lecture today. About safety during a block. The common complications from a nerve block are nerve damage, infection, and systemic toxicity. I'm not going to discuss the most common complication of nerve block, which is failure of the block. And that comes with expertise and experience. We will look at the anatomical, physiological aspects of nerve damage. So, what is the incidence of nerve damage? This is a very good executive summary from ASRA, published in uh, Regional Anesthesia and Pain Medicine. And it's a very concise, very uh, detailed uh, study of the neurological complication. But in the end, it gives the same information that we've had for a while. Well, we really don't show what is the incidence of nerve or neural injury. Because it is very rare. It's not enough power to conduct RCTs or meta-analysis. Our usual methods of risk uh, of, of uh, uh, stratification evidence don't apply. So you can't say there is level 1 evidence, level 2 evidence, because the analysis and RCTs are so few. 
there is a reporting bias. And that is because of lack of registry. Anesthesia is not recorded very well. Uraxial is still better recorded, but peripheral nerve blocks, even in very advanced healthcare systems, um, are not recorded very well. And then the consenting process is poor. Some people don't even bother telling the patient that they are going to do a nerve block for them. And that is poor practice. So let's talk about some numbers. NAP3, or National Audit Project 3, published in 2009, was one of the most extensive uh, reviews of uh, uh, the UK practice of neuraxial injuries. And that came up with the risk of death or paraplegia of a uh, range 1.8 in 100,000 to 0.7 in 100,000. And they gave it pessimistic and optimistic uh, kind of uh, risk. Risk of permanent injury, which is not death or paraplegia, was 1 in 5,800 um, in an adult epidural anesthetic block. And the range went as optimistic as 1 in 12,000. So there's a wide range. There is also a Swedish study looking at the risk of neuraxial injuries at the same time. And they had 1.7 million neuraxial blocks. And they come to the similar conclusion. The factors that contribute to neuraxial injuries show us that epidurals tend to have more injuries than subarachnoid techniques or spinals. And that could be because of the bore of the and that in the spinal we have a clear endpoint, which is for CSF. While epidurals can be very subjective sometimes. Increasing age, older you go, higher the risk of uraxial injuries. And that is because potentially you lose the feel of the ligaments. And that's why the epidural or classic epidural in older person carries a higher risk of uraxial injuries. Females tend to be at high risk. Of course, patients with coagulation abnormalities, and that becomes a relative contraindication and occasionally an absolute contraindication for neuraxial injury. Presence of pre existing neuro neurological uh, conditions such as diabetes, like or spinal stenosis. It doesn't mean you can't do neuraxial techniques in these patients, but the risk is slightly higher. The commonest epidurals are done in obstetrics, but actually the risk of neuraxial injury is one of the lowest in obstetrics, and it's higher actually in orthopedics. But what about peripheral nerve injuries? In early post-operative period, mild paresthesia can be found in up to 15% of the patients who are having peripheral nerve loss. It's not uncommon for patients to say, oh, I've got a bit of numbness and tingling in my leg next day after the block. But we can assure these patients, most of them will be in a few days and occasionally to a few weeks. 99% of peripheral nerve injuries mentioned by the patients are resolved within a year. Serious neurological injuries are reported as rare as 2.4 in 10,000 peripheral nerve blocks. So what are the factors that contribute to peripheral nerve injury? Of course, there are patient factors and there are surgical factors. Pre-existing neurological conditions, as I said before, diabetes, extremely obese patients or extremely malnourished patients, male sex as compared to females for neuraxial injuries, extremes of age, and more proximal nerve blocks, higher the risk of damage. Then you should look at surgical factors as well. Trauma and stretch, the way sometimes people hold the retractors. Compressive dressings and plaster of Paris casts, where you've got to find a compromise with hemostasis and too much compression. Presence of tonicae, hematomas, 
abscesses. Any sort of perioperative inflammation in the area where nerves might be there. And one of the common things, how a patient is positioned. This is a blame kick culture between the anesthetist and the surgeon when there is a nerve damage. But we should all take the blame. It's We can blame everybody else. We are all equally responsible, to be honest. As long as we understand that and work together. So what is the cause of peripheral uh, nerve uh, block injuries? Well, of course, regional anesthesia will be blamed because you're going near a nerve deliberately with a needle in your hand. But also, general anesthesia has to blame. And I have a personal experience uh, of uh, a patient suffering lingual nerve palsy after eye gel. A unilateral lingual nerve palsy and there are eight reports published regarding that so when it comes to nerve injury the first person to blame the anesthetist is the orthopedic surgeon but let's put the blame back for a second let's look at shoulder surgery arthroscopic shoulder surgery the risk is up to 10 percent sometimes of nerve damage and that is where the tractions or where they put the port sites. Open rotator cuff repair reduces the incidence as compared to arthroscopy. But patients having shoulder stabilization have increased risk of radial nerve injuries. Elbow surgery. There is arthroscopic elbow surgery. There is nearly 4% risk of iatrogenic nerve injury. 10% risk of ulnar neuropathy after the elbow replacement. Hip surgeries can be associated with sciatic as well as femoral injuries. Hip arthroscopies can lead to almost up to 13% risk of nerve damage. Knee surgery can carry a risk of nerve damage. And ACL repair can damage saphenous nerve in up to 75% of the patients. And these will usually recover. Tone again. 120 minutes is time that has been shown to be associated with nerve damage. So let's have a look at the anatomy of the nerve. So as you can see, this is a detailed section of the nerve. You can see the, peri the epineurium and then you can see the perineurium and the nerve fascicles inside with some connective tissue. There are some arteries and veins within the nerve. And if you look at an individual fascicles, they will have the endoneurium covering the axons. Now, if you look at this picture carefully, the fascicles are only 0.5 micrometers to maximum 20 micrometers, as these have shown. And you can see in the histological uh, picture here. So if you are looking at a fascicle which is 0.520 micrometers big and your ultrasound, a 15 hertz high frequency linear probe, has a spatial resolution of only 0.2 millimeters, there is no way the ultrasound, in fact the best ultrasounds, cannot differentiate between individual fascicles. Because natural actual resolutions, which you both require, both of them, to be able to see a nerve, are actually quite limited. So let's talk about how anesthetists can cause nerve injury during a nerve block. One is needle trauma. Now we know that needles can directly traumatize a nerve. intraneural injection. There are studies to show that even an intraneural injection does not always lead to nerve damage. But there is a possibility that if your needle enters a nerve and hits a blood vessel causing bleeding, that can lead to hematoma within a nerve, leading to nerve damage. 
but not always. Some studies, some originally when regional anesthesia was described by Halstead and Hall, they actually injected intraneuronally. Of course, they didn't have ultrasound or nerve stimulation at that time. Neuronal ischemia. Now, neuronal ischemia is rare, but it can happen if you put your lobe, for example, in the wrong place, say in the ulnar tunnel at the elbow, where you can put pressure and call ischemia of the nerve. Of course, there is a risk of LA toxicity, which is time and concentration dependent, which can also cause nerve injury. As you know, risk of lignocaine causing uh, neuronal damage or nerve damage during spinal anesthesia. So if I go back to histological uh, picture, if you look at a needle entry tract into a nerve fascicle and your local anesthetic has been injected, it creates a little shrink. Even if you withdraw your needle very quickly, it can occasionally leave a little shrink. And that shrink can cause disruption of some axons. But at the same time, if your needle hits a blood vessel and causing a hematoma, that can make matters worse. But as I said, from Beagle's study, not always. You can see this needle in the subperineural space. The local anesthetic is spreading all around the nerve, and this will provide a very high quality block. Now let's look at classification of nerve injuries. This is something which is well um, described. That is the Sunderland classification and the Seddon classification. We are quite used to using the Seddon classification, which is proxia, exonotmesis, and neurotmesis. As you can see, the stage five on neurotmesis is uh, lead to permanent nerve damage. And require surgical intervention if not uh, done quickly enough there will be permanent nerve damage. Neuropraxy will eventually heal itself, exonotmesis may or may not heal itself. So let's talk about this double crush theory which will answer your questions about pre-existing neurological conditions. This was proposed by Upton and McComas and the idea is that a patient who has a pre existing compromise anywhere along the neural pathway, and now that could be a neuropathy, a polyneuropathy, or conditions like multiple sclerosis. On those patients, even a smaller insult can lead to, can lead to additive effects and a permanent nerve damage or denervation. If you look at this picture, of a normal axon. You see a cell body and the axoplasmic flow. If a small injury stimulus is applied, it can lead to some disruption or neuropraxia or axonotmesis, and this will all heal up most of the time. But if patient has already a pre-existing small injury and you apply another one that can lead to if you apply a big injury stimulus it can cause denervation but if you have a diseased neuron or diseased axon even a tiny stimulus can lead to complete denervation and that is why people with peripheral nerve injuries uh, pre-existing neurological conditions uh, you need to be careful and inform the patient adequately the risk of nerve damage could be potentially higher. But there are some facts that I'd like to talk to you about. Sometimes some people use paresthesia as one of their markers of identifying a nerve. Now paresthesia during needle advancement or local anesthetic injection is not predictive of peripheral nerve injury. So if you're passing your, if you're doing a block and patient starts complaining of tingling when you're putting a needle in, it doesn't always mean there would be a nerve injury. If a 
patient does not have pain on injection, again, it does not mean that there is no injury. But if the patient has severe pain on injection, a lot of times, you first thing you will do is stop injecting. But again, it's not a reliable indicator. So you should not lose sleep because the patient was in pain when you were injecting. But the right to do is stop your injection and try again. Hello? Intraneural injection does not always lead to peripheral nerve injury. Intrafascicular needle insertion and certainly injection should be avoided. You should not deliberately go inject inside a nerve. And if you feel your needles inside a nerve, you should certainly not try to inject into it. That would be my advice. Now, we also know that no single nerve localization technique is superior. Let's talk about peripheral nerve stimulation. Now, this has a low sensitivity but high specificity of nerve to needle contact. What it means is that we accept thresholds or response thresholds between 0.2 to 0.5 milliamps. If you're more than 0.5 milliamps, you are probably outside the nerve. But that's not always necessary. A study in 2009 in anesthesia analgesia by Robert Admir Hansik shows the absence of motor response to nerve stimulus during popliteal sciatic blocks does not exclude intraneural needle placement. And they did ultrasound studies to look at that. So there would be some patients where even with a nerve stimulator with the tip of the needle inside the nerve, you don't get a response. Peripheral nerve injuries can occur despite of using a peripheral nerve stimulation. So how do we inject? Injection is highly subjective. It can often be inaccurate. And that is why my advice is to try to inject yourself because you will have the tactile memory of how it feels from your experience. If you give an assistant to inject, they might not want to say to you it's too high pressure or it's too low pressure. From cadaveric studies, what we know that high injection pressures are bad, which is more than 20 PSI. We know that low injection pressures are good, less than 15 PSI. But not always, because you could be injecting into a blood bag. Hardly get any resistance. There are commercially available pressure monitoring devices in the market that are not highly evidence-based, but can assist you in providing your, making your technique safer. For me personally, I inject myself. That gives me a lot of information. So we thought we have the ultrasound. 50 shades of grey, nothing can go wrong. Unfortunately, guys, is bad news. Even with ultrasound, the risk of nerve damage is not completely gone. The ultrasound can detect some perineural injections, but not intrafascicular injections. They can be subjective. It does improve success rate and speed, but occasionally there is a risk of intravascular injection. So you've got three techniques. You've got ultrasound, you've got nerve stimulator, you have an injection pressure monitor or your own head. And all of them separately do not provide guaranteed safety. So maybe safety lies somewhere in the middle. 
And that is why we should look at some kind of device that assists us when we inject local anesthetic into a patient. We must also look at the types of needles that we use. Nerve trauma is lower with a short bevel needle as compared to our hypodermic long bevel needles. Of course, short needles are wider bore and they can cause more damage if you inject directly into a nerve. Needle approach. Since I started doing blocks, I've always had this idea in my head that I should aim at a nerve at 11 o'clock or 5 o'clock position, which means at a to a nerve. This was confirmed by a cadaveric study by Sermius and Salablon, who published in Anesthesia a few years ago. And that talked about ultrasound guided tangential versus direct needle approach and show a tangential approach will reduce risk of nerve damage for a neural injection in cadaveric study. So if this is my interscaling group, I would like to put my knee in these positions and try not to do it here. Because if you are unable to see the tip of the needle and you're just looking at the shaft, needle then child the tip might be intraneural. If you are at a tangent there is a chance that you might glide or slip over the nerve. Infection I won't talk in great detail it's about aseptic technique and we should always wash our hands, clean sterile gloves, clean probes and aseptic non-touch techniques should be used. A brief word on systemic toxicity. It's about choosing the right drug at the right dose from the right route. I'm sure you are aware. I don't need to tell you this in greater detail. But we need to be informed and aware about the toxic doses of the drugs. Local anesthetic toxicity cardiovascular and central nervous system effects. The factors which contribute are plasma concentrations. So it's based on the peak plasma concentration. Speed of injection. Presence of hyperkalemia and hypercapnia. Hypercapnia will lead to reduced seizure threshold, increasing the risk of neurological complications. Managing local anesthetic toxicity is protocol based and everybody should be aware of the correct guidance and the antidote should be there if you are going to put high volume local anesthetic blocks. Local anesthetic toxicity, if it does happen, the patient starts to develop changed mental status, agitation, convulsions or, or develop cardiovascular signs and symptoms, you stop injecting your local anesthetic and call for help. You want your local toxicity trolleys and trays available. You want to give hundred percent oxygen. You want to follow your ABC guidance. You want to deal with the cardiac arrest with PPR and intravenous intralipid. Intravenous intralipid is given as twenty percent intralipid, one point five milliliters per kilogram over one minute. And you repeat dose after five minutes or up to three boluses and you start an infusion of the same concentration 20 percent in intralipid at 15 mils per kilogram per hour so summary for regional anesthesia safety you need to know your machine you need to know your anatomy you need to know your pharmacology your well trained assistant, a well lit room, your ergonomy should be correct. When you put a block, try not to hurt yourself, your neck, sit down, relax, machine in the line of vision, and do blocks so you remain calm. Make sure resuscitation equipment is available. Local anesthetic toxicity guidelines are available, intralipid is available. 
make sure you have the correct patient, correct site, and doing the correct block. Use a blunt needle. Use something for localization. I'm not saying everybody should run and buy ultrasound machines. I know it's not always practical, but use some kind of assist device. Inject yourself if possible and let the needle go. Our tissues should be trusted. They will keep the needle in place. Aim at five o'clock or 11 o'clock tangential approach. I love to deal with things when they go wrong. Establish and follow your local policies. Practice, practice, and more practice. Thank you for your patience and thank you for listening. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Tushar, for excellent. Thank you, Tushar. Yeah, can you? I'm um, here. Hello. Yeah, yeah, you are audible. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Hello. So, uh, Tushar, there is a question for you from my side. Uh, so, as you told, uh, there are 15% chances that a patient has some neurological damage after giving block. So, mm -hmm. how do you assess those patients in the post-operative ward? Uh, ward? Uh, do the anesthetist take post-operative round or uh, anesthesia nurses take round? And what do you look uh, for uh, uh, in the ward for uh, uh, any neurological injury? How do you assess it? So I can divide this into two parts, uh, Hetal. So there is uh, neuraxial blocks and peripheral nerve blocks. Tushar, can you please speak loudly or can you uh, bring the uh, microphone yeah. here? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. better. OK, so uh, it, we have, I have to divide this into neuraxial injuries, uh, neuraxial blocks, and peripheral blocks. So the neuraxial blocks, spinals and epidurals, they are followed up next day by the pain team. Sound is not clear, Tushar. Uh, sorry, I'm talking quite loudly. Can you hear me? Hello? Yeah, I, I can hear you, but uh, yeah. Um, so, um, so we have separate policies for neuraxial blocks, spinal epidurals, and peripheral nerve blocks. And peripheral nerve blocks. Am I coming through? Yes, I can hear you. Go ahead. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Have, so Please so go ahead. We, we have different policies for neuraxial blocks and peripheral nerve blocks. For neuraxial blocks, mm -hmm. they are followed up uh, next day by the pain team. We have acute pain team in our hospital. Okay. If not, the anesthetist, right. duty of the anesthetist to follow them up. Uh, most of patients or a lot of patients who get peripheral nerve blocks are day case patients. So we don't routinely follow them up. But of course, we send them home with advice and information for any problems to ring them back. So we indirectly find out about them through the surgeons normally, that if there has been any problem. But as I said, 15% risk, which I've uh, put down, is the risk of a uh, um, uh, uh, bit of neuropraxia or a block lasting more than expected. Patients don't tend to complain a lot about that. So we don't get many complaints. I mean, the risk of peripheral nerve block complaints is actually really, really small. I mean, I've never had a complaint about this before. So it's very difficult to say, again, what the risk of complaint would be. We get more problems with spinals, especially obstetrics, where the patients will complain of patchy numbness here and there afterwards. Uh, and we just reassure them. And most of the time, they recover by the time they're discharged. So for peripheral nerve blocks, we don't follow them up, but for neuraxial, we do, definitely. Uh, another question is from audience. Uh, what preemptive treatment can we start post-op if we are suspecting no injury while giving block? So do we give anything preemptively like steroid or anything else? So we don't do it, anything like this. Nothing, no preemptive pharmacological treatment. Uh, and again, because the risk of uh, having a nerve injury is so small, reassurance mostly helps. Even if you tell the patient, you know, it will wear off in a week or a few weeks, uh, they're usually fine. We say normally six weeks. By six weeks, the injury or the sensation will wear off. Unless, of course, it's a catastrophic change. For example, after a spinal, uh, someone's had problem with cordyquina or something like this. 
or severe foot drop or something like that. In which case you have to do MRI scans urgently. For nerve conduction studies and any sort of nerve investigations, we don't uh, tend to do it within six weeks. If something persists afterwards, then only we will arrange investigation. What I tend to do intraoperatively is give people um, non-steroidals if they can accept it as an anti-inflammatory. Because I think whenever we put needles near a nerve, there is some degree of inflammatory reaction. And if the needle is touching the nerve, there may be some swelling there. So I give them some anti-inflammatory. As a preemptive, we don't give any treatment. And even for obstetrics, if some there is an issue with a spinal, for example, or an epidural, we investigate them first, do the scans, and then take neurosurgical advice. But we don't give them any pharmacological treatment. Okay. So another common question, suppose patient is on dual platelet. So how will you, uh, how long will you wait uh, before giving spinal or epidural? Will you repeat the question, please? Patient is on dual antiplatelets and yeah. the patient uh, requires spinal or epidural. So for plant surgery, how will you, how long will you wait uh, before giving spinal or epidural? How many days? Okay. So uh, one is you look at the indication. If the patient is on dual antiplatelet therapy, they should not be having an, a planned operation unless it's urgent surgery. But if they are having urgent surgery and they are on aspirin or clopidogrel or both, if they are on both, it has to be seven days. Uh, on aspirin, we give people spinals. We don't stop aspirin for spinals anymore. Uh, for uh, But for epidurals, of course, for aspirin, it's seven days. And clopidogrel, it's blanket seven days. Okay. Uh, I suppose, uh, Tushar, you are giving all the blocks with uh, ultrasound. So do you combine uh, it, it with a PNS or a pressure monitoring while giving block or you uh, uh, give injection yourself and uh, look for the pressure changes, any pressure ch changes in the syringe? So when I started with my blocks, I used to use PNS as well as ultrasound. Now I think I have got enough experience that I just use the ultrasound. I don't use PNS. Because PNS makes things confusing for me uh, sometimes. With ultrasound, I, I'm quite confident how near I need to go to a nerve. Uh, but I do always inject myself and use my own hand as my pressure monitoring device. I don't let the assistant do the injection. Because assistants come in different shapes and sizes. They have different strengths. So I just inject myself and use ultrasound. Uh, do you keep, keep same uh, syringe like 10 syringe or you keep changing it no it's uh, quite standard so we have a non lure lock syringes so which means you cannot attach iv set to it so that's what we use as one of our safety features in my hospital uh, and that will eventually become a uk standard the spinal needles are all non lure lock okay um, but when okay. Uh, okay. we use they come in 10 and 20 mils and occasional 5 mils for spinals but they come in 10 and 20 Terrible. mils. Okay. Uh, uh, another question is from audience that uh, patient is on uh, uh, antiplatelets and if you want to give peripheral nerve block, uh, will you give it uh, or uh, will you... Uh, which so block will you give? Uh, uh, so I, I will repeat the question. question uh, yeah. Which blocks will you give? Peripheral nerve blocks will you give in and on dual end? Platelets. So if a patient is just on aspirin, okay, then I think it's quite safe to give any peripheral nerve block. If patient is on dual antiplatelets or they're on anticoagulation of any sort, if I can't press on the area, then I don't give a nerve block. You know what I mean? For example, if I'm doing a femoral or an interscalene, then that's okay. You can press on it. Infraclavicular, you can't press on it. Or a psoas compartment right. block, you can't press on it. So I don't give a, a, a lumbar plexus block, for example, if patient is on uh, any sort of a dual antiplatelet or they are on anticoagulated. But if I can press on the area and I can control hemostasis like that, then it's a small needle. And if you use ultrasound, you should not take many attempts. Uh, it should, and you should be able to press on it and keep an eye on the any bleeding issues. 
But as I said, any deep locks where I can't access by pressure, I don't give them. Right. So do you give uh, blocks under general anesthesia like an adult patient uh, after putting LMA, you give blocks or do you give all the blocks awake? Uh, and if anything goes wrong, uh, if you're given uh, the block under GA, if anything goes wrong, is there any legal implication in UK or not? So um, this is a little bit older concept here that some people used to give blocks before a general anesthesia. And the reason is that if a patient is awake, then they would uh, complain of paresthesia or pain. Now, this didn't make any sense to me. And the current practice uh, for us is we give the blocks after general anesthesia. Two reasons. There is no evidence to say that blocks awake are safer than blocks asleep. Uh, there is no literature to say that if you do blocks awake against people, if you are, if you are already anesthetized, there is increased risk of complications after GA. Okay. And the second reason is that we already say in the past that we used to use paresthesia to identify the nerves. So if you're using paresthesia, how do we know that we are not causing nerve damage already? So that is the reason it didn't make any sense to keep a patient awake and give blocks. It is so much better for anxiolysis uh, that patient is asleep if they wish to be asleep. We do awake blocks if patients are going to be awake for the whole operation. And that is something we do quite a lot as well. But we don't give them GA after giving a block. We give them GA first, get situation under control, and then give them a block. Thank you. Uh, another question from audience. Are you using LA mixture in peripheral nerve blocks, like combining xylocalin with a sensor can to reduce the toxicity? Or are you using single LA agent? Right. So it depends on what I'm doing. Now, usually, if I'm doing a block after general anesthesia, uh, then we are using just plain levobupivacaine. Chirocaine is what we have normally here. That's what we use. There is some uh, work done on using dexamethasone in uh, local anesthetic blocks. But a study a few years ago said there was no difference if you give a block I, uh, perineural or IV, if you give IV dex or perineural dex. So I personally don't mix uh, anything um, if a patient is having a general anesthetic. If patient is having awake surgery, for example, then I usually do hand surgery here awake. In which case, I give them a local anesthetic lignocaine with adrenaline in the supraclavicular region uh, because it is short acting and four or five hours later it wears off. And then we put some uh, bupivacaine for the individual nerves, so post operative pain relief. That is the only time we use lignocaine with adrenaline. Normally, we just use single agents. Suppose if I'm uh, combining two agents, uh, xylocaine with adrenaline and bupivacaine for a supraclavicular block. So can I give highest volume of the drug, like a toxic level of uh, 7 kg of uh, xylocaine with adrenaline and 2 milligram per kg of uh, bupivacaine, or it should be in reduced dosages? So in that case, I will look at the longest acting local anesthetic, uh, in which case, in this case, it is bupivacaine. And I will reduce the dose of that by two thirds. By, by one third, I reduce the dose. So I give two thirds of the dose. That's how I would. And then I will add some lignocaine with adrenaline there. Right. So I reduce the uh, dose. Are of the you using any one. additive? OK. Uh, so using any additives uh, like Dexona or other additives? Uh, we, we initially we were using some dexamethasone we have stopped that we don't use any additives anymore some of my colleagues use clonidine uh, but that's quite rare as well in terms of the block duration if you look at the sensory block duration that is uh, statistically significant in some studies but clinically it's a question of one or two hours and i don't think it's a huge difference so we don't use anything mixed in our local anesthetic we just give people a uh, single agent uh, and warn them about multimodal analgesia that the block is going to wear off and take multimodal analgesia from the start. Uh, do you use any catheters uh, and is there any chances, uh, is there any difference between uh, uh, no damage with catheter or without catheter? 
So in my hospital, we is don't there an use, increased chance? So in terms of if you use catheters, in my hospital, we don't use a lot of catheters for uh, uh, upper limbs. We don't use catheters and occasionally we use for lower limbs. We use a lot more catheters for abdominal surgeries. So rectus sheath catheters and wound infiltration catheters, we use those. Um, especially for any sort of midline or fan and steel uh, incisions. Um, in terms of nerve injuries, there is a risk of catheter misplacement, dislodgement. So I've not seen many increased nerve injuries with catheters, but there is a risk of nerve block failure. That's what we have seen with some catheters that we have done. For example, interscalene catheters for upper limb surgery. Uh, they dislodge quite easily. So uh, more than nerve damage, we haven't seen nerve damage. We have definitely seen nerve block, block failures more than single shot. Uh, there is, uh, th this is last question th that is from audience. How do you give PNS block under GA with muscle relaxation? I think it's not possible, but you can answer it. Um, well, you can't, uh, but if you're intubating someone, if you use choline or succinethonium, and then when it wears off, you can do the block and then give the long acting muscle relaxant afterwards. But if somebody is paralyzed, is you can't do a nerve stimulator block. And that is again a reason that we have trained ourselves not to use nerve stimulators anymore. So those who are got better with ultrasound, uh, it doesn't matter. You, they, that limitation is gone because you can still do a block when patients asleep. Uh, the last question, uh, uh, it has come just now. When you are using a, uh, USG, how do you uh, prepare a probe? What uh, aseptic precaution do you uh, take when you are preparing a probe? So um, a lot of people use just aseptic non-touch technique. So we have a clean probe. We clean it with 2% sunny cloth, chlorhexidine. Uh, and we use sterile gloves, we keep sterile field, and the needle and probe never touch each other. So we don't cover the probes. For some conditions, say if the needle and probe are going to be quite near to each other, or in pediatrics, for example, we have probe covers available. So we use our probe covers. But there are some videos on uh, uh, the internet where you can use a sterile glove as well. If we are doing a catheter, whether it's an epidural catheter or any nerve block catheter, then it's full scrub with surgical scrub, mask, gown, everything. But for nerve blocks, peripheral nerve blocks, we don't use uh, full mask, gown. It's like taking blood with a hypodermic needle. That's all we are doing. But we use sterile field rather than a full sterile technique. So it is sterile, it's clean, but we don't do full scrub. Uh, for the probes, we cover them with just a probe cover or nothing. Uh, uh, there is one more question. If you have time, we can take it, or otherwise yeah, yeah, you can answer that's, on that's, Facebook. That's fine. That's that's fine. No problem. Can I ask the question? Y yes, you can. Yes, you can. Yeah. So, if a patient is on a higher dose of aspirin, like three hundred milligram uh, or higher, uh, is it safer to give spinal anesthesia or epidural? Well, I would not give both. Uh, if patient is on three hundred milligrams. Personally, I would not give either because. There is no way the, the benefit of spinal will outweigh the risk of having a hematoma. Low dose aspirin, we can give them spinal uh, or epidural. Uh, but even epidural is, I think, risky. So we don't give epidurals on low dose spinals. Uh, spinal is no problem. But high dose uh, anticoagulation or antiplatelets, definitely no, no, for neuraxial anesthesia, neuraxial blocks. Uh, there is one more question. If you have to give interscalenian axillary brachial plexus block, which block will you give first? I think uh, uh, he or she is asking about uh, a PNS guided block. Uh, so, so, say again. Uh, uh, someone uh, wants to give both block, interscalenia as well as axillary brachial plexus block with PNS. So, which block will you give first? Will it be interscalenia uh, or axillary? <laughs> one, is, one is, why do you want to give the two blocks? Secondly, I talked to you before about the uh, double crush uh, thing. If you, the, the double crush says that if you damage or if you damage a nerve at two points, same nerve, the, the damage would be worse. 
so i will not give axillary as well as interscalene in the same person yes but i will give an an, an axillary and a peripheral uh, nerve so an individual nerve block as rescue analgesia if my block is not working but i will not specifically go and do two types of brachial plexus blocks it is same as giving uh, a, a, a swaz compartment block and a femoral nerve block isn't it so you will not uh, so, uh, yeah so i believe question is um, suppose i have given interscalene block and uh, i won't give uh, distal nerve block with pns then will i will i get the response with pns or not i yes, think the question yes, is you, like that yes you will get the response because uh, i i don't see why not uh, you will still get a response because you have not taken the electrical supply away of the nerve it's not uh, you know we haven't taken the neuromus stop the neuromuscular junctions there you will still get a response from the nerve uh, what you might not get is the patient uh, you know telling you what's happening down there but you will still get the twitching i think yeah. i've never tried it i don't know hetal if you have tried this um uh, i uh, uh, we give uh, uh, this thing obturator now block green panel but i have never done uh, uh, distal block after giving interscalene block yeah no neither have i so can i keep asking or keep asking uh, keep asking because questions are coming yeah so what what platelet levels are acceptable for giving blocks and for, for giving a uh, spinal or epidural so for spinal and epidural above 100 is acceptable below 80 is not acceptable in our practice 80 and 100 is your uh, or uh, 80000 and 100000 is your gray area and you have to do the risk and benefit if the patient has severe respiratory comorbidities for example you know and you feel that a patient's best interest is to have a spinal uh, then you're looking at risk and benefit ratio in which case i will go ahead and do the spinal but if the patient is otherwise well and you're not worried about ga apart from the usual thing that ga has slightly higher risk then i will not do so you you need to look at risk and benefit peripheral nerve blocks are a bit different again as i said if your platelets are low they are below 80 uh, and you are on a superficial i would say anything above 50 i will give them a peripheral nerve block as long as i know i can press on it or i can put compression on it and any deep blocks i will still do what i do for my spinals above 100 safe below 80 not safe 80 to 100 case by case decision below 50 i will probably not give them an art block uh thank you tushar uh, that's it uh, i hope i have not missed any question uh, you go through the discussion uh, i will yes some question you can answer those question on facebook uh, thank you very much tushar uh, thank you all for joining us can uh, i just say one thing hetal i'm i'm sorry i've not been able yes, to yes, yes. do it please, please i've not been able to do it live because i have a case in theater uh so it's our timings don't match so i apologize for that uh, but i will uh, answer afterwards on the facebook group thank you thank you matushar thank you bye bye